Um, so my name is Yoi Sugai. I'm a group leader at St. Spear Welcome Center. And today I will take you through uh, what we're calling semi-chronic recording paradigm using neuropixels probes. Uh, so here's the outline of this lecture. Uh, first of all, uh, I will discuss what semi-chronic recording is and why such a paradigm is useful. I will also talk about the basic requirements of semi-chronic systems. Now, I would then showcase five different systems today, and we're extremely fortunate that we're joined by some of the developers of these systems at this lecture. I would then discuss various considerations when setting up these experiments, and at the end, we open the floor to Q&A, as well as the discussion among uh, implant developers. So let's get started. So first off, so what is a semi-chronic paradigm and why do we need it? So for the purpose of this talk, I will separate semi-chronic methods from chronic methods. Uh, what I mean by chronic methods would be something that's already been covered in the course that, uh, that uses permanently cemented probes. And it's really for long-term recording for months and so. So semi-chronic recording, on the other hand, uh, often the scope of these experiments could be a little bit shorter term, maybe up to two weeks to, to a few months. And, and importantly, that we aim to explant uh, these sem uh, the probes, implanted probes, and we use them. So why might we want to do that? Uh, first of all, we sometimes want to get data from many animals by using a limited number of probes. And second, um, there might be some circumstances where we actually want to get more units out of a single animal. So, so that requires us to use basically to advance or retract probes in, within the same animal. So for this reason, um, what are the technical requirements for semi-chronic system? So first, the, chronic, uh, the critical requirements are uh, of course, it has to be mechanically resilient. We don't really want to have the probe, probes broken during the recording. We also want the good stability of recording, a low noise and retains units over time. And because we're putting these implants on mouse or rat's head, we want them to be lightweight. And of course, we really want the reproducible probe retriever procedure. In addition, one might actually want to track units over time for long periods of time. And also, as, as I mentioned earlier, that maybe we actually want to adjust, readjust the probe position. So to satisfy these requirements, many systems use a similar principle for explantable design. So I want to just go over the principles. <clears throat> So what we need are basically three components. So first is the base. So the base attaches to the skull and then another piece that's probe with the probe carrier that carries the probe and screws that hold these two pieces together. So to implant, first is to really to put these all these parts together and then take this assembly and then implant into the animal's head and then basically cement this base onto the skull. So to retrieve, what you're gonna do then is the reverse. So what you're gonna do is to unscrew bolts and basically that will allow the probe cassette to be explanted. Alternatively, one could adjust the implant up and down and screw back again. So that, that will allow resampling of different neurons within the same animal. You might have thought that this, you might have seen this kind of design before. In fact, the idea is very similar to Moonlander. The great news is that we know, uh, we now have at least five different semi-chronic designs of this flavor to choose from. 
and I will briefly go through each of them today. So the first up is from Churchill Lab, and, um, <clears throat> and this is a pioneering method. And they designed a 3D printable base and probe holder. So base is called external casing and probe holder is called internal mount. And, and then basically these are lightweight, weighs two grams with the probe, but um, without the, um, uh, including cement and then three ground with head stage. And, and these internal mount and external casing is um, secured together with the cement over here. And then so to retrieve the implant, what you're gonna do is to basically break off the cement. And then this is how this animal looks like. It's a very compact design and lightweight. So this system has enabled them to report from freely moving animals in visual cortex, hippocampus, and midbrain. So this is one of the kind of figures from their paper. Um, so what, what it's showing is basically the units in, a, in, a, in the depth of the probe over days. And as you can see that the actual unit preservation is quite good. So the, the stability of, of the unit is quite good. You actually get, get a pretty good number of units over maybe two weeks. And in some instances, they were able to look at the waveform and find similar ones uh, over multiple days. And then uh, in terms of the stability of units, uh, you will see throughout this talk a uh, graph like this, and that basically has the y-axis, there's isolated units, and then x-axis is uh, the number of days. And you see the various flavor of this graph throughout the talk. And as you can see in this system, for example, this, is, uh, this shows that the system is actually quite stable. So in summary, um, this design is lightweight, made of 3D printed parts, and has a really good stability. And importantly, they provide uh, detailed bench protocols with CAT files. And I think that's really important um, when you want to adopt these kind of methods. And then we're fortunately joined by Ashley who developed the system. So I wanted to ask you, Ashley, did I, did I forget anything important to say? Uh, do you have anything to add? No, I think that was a great summary. Thank you. Yeah, the only thing I'll say is that the design that's on the GitHub is for the original, or rather an older version of the NeuroPixels probes, and so they do need to be adapted. I'm almost positive some lab has done this, um, and, and maybe someone here knows. Um, I know there's labs at UCSD who have adapted it for the 2.0 probes. Um, that also means that some of the weight will be slightly different as well, because I think the new head stage is much smaller than the head stage that we used. So that actually means the weight will be lighter. Great point. So I think it's really good to, to know that uh, you know, there's you know, the community of people who are using this system. All right, thank you so much. So next up is from the Brody Lab. So this system is very unique. This is designed for multi-months recording in rats. And as in the design, um, as for the design, the system consists of the probe adapter, um, right here in the base, external shash. And they are connected by screws and which will be implanted to the animal. And then the 3D printed parts weighs around 2.66 grams and this excludes probe and head stage. And remarkably, this system accommodates multi-probe recording. So you can use up to four neuropixels 1.0 probes, which I think is pretty amazing. So another advantage of the system is that the system has been extensively benchmarked. So for example, Thomas and Adrian, who developed this system, recorded from at least 17 different brain areas and for more than a month. So what they suggest in this particular um, uh, report is that <clears throat> the unit loss seem to depend on the brain area they recorded. So for example, here, uh, what you're showing is the, the three different areas and, and then kind of a trend for unit drop-off. So as you can see, some areas such as motor cortex may be actually significantly suffer from the unit loss compared to other areas. 
And also they found that as a general trend, they, um, they found that the unit loss is worse in most posterior region compared to anterior region, and then maybe in a dorsal region over ventral region. So in summary, this system is really specialized for rats and, and can accommodate as many as four neuropixels 1.0 probes and uses 3D printed parts. And importantly, they again provide detailed step-by-step -step bench protocol along with CAT files. And then today we're uh, joined by Adrian, who is one of the developers of this system. Adrian, um, can you maybe fill in something that I might've missed? Uh, I think you did a very good job. Um, and I think it worked well to have, have this presented right after Ashley's design, which was definitely an inspiration for ours. Um, I think the main changes we made were, as you say, um, to optimize it for, for rats. So it, it's a little bit bulkier. It's a little bit, it provides a little bit more protection for the probe. Um, and, uh, not just specialized for rats, but we wanted to be to allow, as you say, many months recordings in rats and allow for our rats to behave for long stretches of time in an unmonitored way. So um, our rats are doing a, a decision making task where we often um, leave them unmonitored during a recording for many hours. Um, and so another feature of our design was to protect the um, delicate cables from being uh, twisted and broken when rats were behaving unmonitored for such a long time. The cables are actually uh, enclosed in a, in a kind of stiff uh, plastic sleeve, um, which protects them. It basically prevents the rat from rotating more than two or three times um, and protects the cables from small bending radiuses. That was especially important for early test phase um, recordings where the cables were a little bit less robust than they are now. So I think the need for that may have uh, been reduced with, with the currently available cables. Um, but it does provide that advantage that we can kind of just let our rats record and, and not, not really worry for many hours. Um, and um, it, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. yeah, so. No, thank you, Adrian. I think this aspect of say protection of the implant and you know kind of be able to let this go, you know, without much intervention, I think it's a really important aspect of this uh, design. All right, thanks, Adrian. And so we're gonna move on to the next one. Uh, this is from a Sebastian Hazel lab. Um, <clears throat> so this is a very complete design. Uh, first, they again use three D printed parts for the base and the probe mount, which also includes rooms, room to house a head stage. And importantly, this assembly is then protected by additional casing. And they've used this system to record an olfactory cortex and, and the stability of units over time, you know, over two weeks is good. And they show that the assembly, probe assembly can be reused. So you can actually see that the, the number of different insertions that, that they've made, and then that, and maybe they don't really have an appreciable decline in the performance of these probes. So the data shown just in the previous slide was using NeuroPixels 2.0 probes, but this system is indeed compatible with NeuroPixels 1.0 probes. So this you know, the NeuroPixel 1.0 probes, of course, weighs a little bit more, but overall weight of this implant is 3.7 grams. So this is compatible with, with mice. In addition, they designed two probe version as well as adjustable version. And, and this is primarily uh, intended for rats. So in summary, uh, so Hazelite design uses 3D printed parts compatible with both 1.0 and 2.0, although, uh, some of the requirements might, might vary for mice and rats. Um, so they are well protected and then produces stable units. And then again, that the, there is a detailed protocol paper that describes bench protocols, to how to do this, along with the CAT files. And, and then this design is very versatile. It has different kinds of configurations, single uh, probe mode, 
for rat, mouse and rat and double probes and adjustable configurations. <clears throat> I'm not sure if I um, have any representative from this design. I don't think Sebastian uh, is here uh, today. Maybe Yo, can I um, point out one more thing about this design and, and maybe ask a question. One, one aspect of this design is that they have designed a um, particular fixture for when you want to remove the probe. So it attaches back to the skull connector and then allows you to just unscrew smoothly the, the probe from the brain. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you are comparing um, how that removal procedure works in these different designs and whether, um, you know, whether, yeah, what, what the success rate of that would be in different designs or how easy it is to do in different designs or anything like that? I mean, I don't, I have a slide to talk about the retrieval procedure, but I'm not comparing them on different kinds of implants. So it's something that maybe that uh, people here can actually uh, chip in uh, when, when I talk about it. I mean, and that's a really important aspect of the, all these implants, you know, what's the really the success rate? Uh, great point. Um, so anyway, so, um, uh, Maybe I'll just say one more super quick thing, which is that um, for the 2.0 probes, at least, there is a double probe version of this uh, Hessler one for mouse. Um, I don't think for a 1.0 probe, it would be a double probe version, but for the 2.0, where a single head stage can do two probes. Okay. There's one for mouse. Really good point. Thank you. So I think I'm sure that the Sebastian would be very happy to answer questions if you have any any questions, and then maybe you can email them, uh, email him. Um, okay, so moving on, and then next up is from my lab. Um, so we developed this system to measure neural activities during social interactions, and and then so our system uses a slightly different components from other system, which uses actually machine parts. So they, they're made out of aluminum. And then we have this element that holds the probe that we call probe cassette. And then the ones that are basically the base is, are the poles. So these poles guide the, the cassette. And then, so one of the really benefits of this design is that you can actually readjust the probe position up and down. Yeah, these poles and cassette is basically just secured by the screw. So you can unscrew it and go up and down and we can actually uh, adjust the, the implantation site. So, so this assembly for NeuroPixel 1.0 uh, probes, it weighs around 4.5 grams and it's slightly on the heavier side and three gram without head stage. And, and then uh, this is how it looks. So you can see the whole assembly here. And as I mentioned that, you know, we wanted to have this system for, for the study of social interaction, which sometimes involves a very kind of um, violent action. So rough and tumble fights, for example, we really want it to be resilient for, for those kinds of behaviors. So it does actually perform well in these instances. And um, the only problem that we encounter with this system, initial version system, is that when we co-house implanted animal and non-implanted animal for long term, um, what happens is that the cage mate chew up on their uh, flex, uh, flex cable and then damages the probe. So for NeuroPixel 2.0 version, what we decided to do actually just to put a hat and protect the whole thing. And just because the NeuroPixel 2.0 probe is smaller, um, probe is smaller and head stage is smaller, we're able to protect them very well. And in a unit loss, uh, as you can see here, it, it, Let's say there's an initial drop off of these units and then it becomes somewhat more stable. But because of this drop off, we recommend that these system use for recording of short term, for example, two weeks. So in summary, that um, our implants made out of aluminum and it's compatible with NeoPixels 1.0 and 2.0 has been used for mouse and rats. And, and then it, uh, this recording has been primarily made in amygdala and then compatible with social interactions and readjustable. And uh, it has a low footprint, which I'm going to discuss a little bit more in detail later why this is really important. And it's best suited for short-term recording. Um, so one pitfall is that the, this is not yet published, but it has been widely adopted at UCL. So we have um, a developer of this uh, uh, system, Daniel, for my lab. Uh, Daniel, did I forget anything? 
important to say here. Not that I can think of. Thank you. That was a good job. Okay. So maybe we're going to move on for, for the interest of time. Okay, so the last unit is, uh, last design is very new and from the Cortex lab, of course, currently in Harris lab. Um, so, so this consists of two parts again. So the payload module, which is basically glued together that has two, up to two NeuroPixel 2.0 probes. And, and there's another one that's called docking module that's basically attached to the skull. And then these two modules are uh, united with, with the screw. So you can see this schematics here. And, and here's the uh, actual thing. So you can see the screws that actually connects the docking module and the payload module. So this system was developed so that it will achieve at least two goals. And one is really the lightweight. And the other one is, is really the long-term stability over days. So in terms of the weight, uh, what you can see is this is a kind of a realistic estimate of how implant weighs and maybe various designs. And um, so as you can see, this, this version um, so this version includes a cement probe, uh, at least one NeuroPixel 2.0 probe, and then a holder and a head plate. And as you can see that the, uh, this version is achieving you know, lighter weight than other designs. And, and I think this is really important because obviously that the weight of the implant potentially could limit your experiment, what kind of animals you can use. And a lot of the mice that you might be using are B6, which weighs maybe around 25 grams. So having this 10% limit of the weight uh, reaching that is, uh, is a really important goal. And in terms of the stability, so this, this is how the mouse looks after implantation. Um, so they've sh shared with us uh, very preliminary uh, uh, recording data. And, and um, what's remarkable is that this design uh, basically uh, allows the, the, the units to be stable over say two weeks. And this is a recording done in V1. And uh, so if you see this graph that they usually there's a characteristic drop in units in the, in the first couple of days after implant. And after that, the units uh, are stable and uh, there is no apparent bias in um, the distribution of, of of the unit loss in, 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 a, uh, in different parts of the shank. So in summary, this design provide lightweight um, and, and then using 3D printed part and support dual neural pixels 2.0 probes and is benchmarked for long-term unit stability. And we're joined by uh, Pip and Cillian who developed this design. Do you guys uh, have things to add? Uh, no, not really. That was, that was uh, great. Just to say that the, um, this, this mouse and one other are still stable, at least. So it was, as you said, very new data. So it's now, I guess, at day 22 and, and seems to be um, still stable. But uh, yeah. Maybe I'll add that the 10% that, that figure applies to the rule that we follow in our lab uh, that the implant and should not be more than 10 percent of the weight of a mouse but you might have different rules in your labs great point all right so thank you Pip. so given that you have now choice of at least five designs which paradigm should you be picking for your project and I, the message what I want to send is that um, there is actually no one-stop shop for a semi-chronic platform. And the reason why is that these systems have been developed for a different applications in mind. They might actually be optimized for a recording in a particular brain area 
or maybe particular behavior paradigms. So it's really important for you to think about what system have actually achieved something similar to what you want to do. And then consider, especially, what is the target brain area? How long do you want to record? What is the weight of the animal to be implanted? Which version of NeuroPixels probes are you using? Will you record the activities in head fix, freely behaving solitary or freely behaving social context? And lastly, really, this is an important point. Do you know anyone using one of the systems in your local environment? And I think that the, you know, everyone knows that the, if there's anyone who's using one of these implants in your neighbor, it's really easy to just check it out and find out how things are working. And that really leverages you to set up your own system in your lab. And I attach a comparison chart here. I'm not going to go through this. Maybe if you want to rewind the video later on, I hope this might be useful. And if there's something wrong about this, please let me know. I can correct it. OK, so I'm going to talk about probe recovery. And, and the, I'm not going to talk about the probe implantation, because this is something that's already been covered in, in, the, um, in the rest of the course. Uh, but I just wanted to talk about the probe recovery. Uh, because this might be something that uh, many, many of you may actually have a common question, which is how tricky is it? How reproducible is it? Um, just the bottom line is that in our case, that the probe recovery has been close to 100%. And, and then many of these paradigms we just discussed, I assume that will be the case. Um, however, there, there are actually lots of consideration to make to make this probe recovery smooth and successful. Um, so, so maybe I just provide a couple of different points that are particularly relevant for our, uh, for our design, and I can't really speak for every design, so developers, please chime in if I miss something. So first thing is that the precise alignment to manipulate the axis is really critical. You don't want to actually um, put in, you know, excess force to, to the implant while you're actually pulling it out. Um, Next, I think what happens sometimes that what we notice is that sometimes the site of craniotomy is blocked and, and it, you can see that, that there's something else in, in, the, in, in, the, um, in the site of craniotomy that might sometimes look like a blood clot or something that's actually a little bit more viscous. And when this blockage happens, it's going to be very difficult to pull the probe out successfully. So. Um, so this, you know, basically really need, need to make sure that you need to clear this. And sometimes uh, for implants longer than two weeks old could actually pose additional challenge because there might be bone regrowth. So make sure you check out uh, these things are, you know, the cytocraniotomy is not blocked. And in some systems, actually, it's very difficult to check out whether this cytocraniotomy is blocked or not, because maybe the view of the probe entry point may be obstructed. So this poses additional challenge. So if we can make sure that these uh, this side of craniotomy is not blocked, at least in our, in our particular case, retrieval is actually has been very smooth, straightforward, and fast. So I'm just going to show you a quick video of on, on the right and what happens. So. So you can see the shank, and this is in real time. And just pulling it out, and, and it's basically done. So it's very fast. And, and importantly, when you pull out the probe, you really want to thoroughly clean it uh, using, uh, most typically using enzymes. And, uh, and then, make sure you ch check electrical properties to, to make sure that the probe is still intact. So I want to just really ask you for the, for the, for the probe, de um, probe developers, what's, what's been your typical experience with the probe recovery? Maybe if Ashley's still around, maybe you can comment. Yeah, I think with our, with the final design, it was actually 
fairly good. I would say more than two thirds, um, maybe three quarters of animals. The most common problem I think that we experienced, which you pointed out was something had kind of grabbed onto the probe and that was preventing it from, from actually pulling out of the brain. And so that was the main thing. Um, and I definitely agree with your point about the alignment between the axis that you're pulling out on being really, really critical too. Um, I also think that the newer probes have a more support around the shank, the base of the shank. And so that'll actually improve the success rate here quite a bit. Great point. How about you, Adrian? Um, I don't think I have too much to add on this point. Our, we, we figured out some things to optimize to make the explantation more successful. And our final design, which is documented in the paper, is also has a very high success rate. Daniel. Uh, only one thing came to mind, and that was um, when talking about the new probes, I think with four shank probes, you can experience more points of contact with any viscous substance in the brain. So that causes more friction perhaps when retrieving, which I think we saw with one dummy, but it was successful. Um, but I don't have much experience with the four shank, so I can't speak to it fully. Thanks. How about uh, Pip and Cillian? Do you have anything to add? Um, well, so far we've explanted one and it was successful. So <laughs> we're at 100%, but <laughs> um, that may change uh, very soon. <laughs> That's good. It, I, think, I think this is my impression that every system actually really performed very well uh, in terms of probe recovery. But it doesn't mean that you know, this is not going to be um, smooth. So I think there are uh, consideration to make. Okay, thank you guys. Yeah, I guess uh, one thing I would add actually before moving on is you can't practice enough, right? So the more practice you have with dummies, the better you'll be. And there's no um, way around that. So <laughs> just practice. And when you get a few dummies in a row, then use the real thing. Great point. So I want to talk about briefly other type of pitfalls. Uh, so maybe as much as I can cover, uh, as much as I can think of. So first is, uh, Kind of an interesting point, but the footprint of the implant. So it turns out that because of the cement that you would need to, to use to secure the base, some areas, some brain areas that you're implanting, targeting, might be more difficult to put the implant than others. So, so some systems accommodate smaller footprint than others. So if you're thinking about putting your implant in the back of the brain, it might be actually a little bit more difficult, limited footprint. So that's something that you want to really consider. And then a uh, second uh, thing is that the, you know, all these designs actually made to be very, very flexible. You know, you might be able to design a slightly modified version of the 3D prints or maybe even the machine parts. And I think that you should take advantage of it. So for example, you might have a uh, use case where you might want to put the implant in a really extremely lateral side of the brain. And that actually produced the very, strange you know, weight distribution. So, so what can you do? Maybe one idea is you might actually use the head stage to down and balance. So this really requires a special kind of modification of the existing device. And another possibility is this angle insertion. So if you want to insert in an angle way, but in an extreme angle, uh, what might be helpful is to actually have a custom base design. And lastly, maybe not the least, is the consideration about the unit loss. It is a major problem, even though these implant design achieves a very stable recording over days and maybe weeks and months. Um, we should keep in mind that this depends on the brain area also, but in general trend, the unit drops off over days and you know, weeks and months. So, so if it turns out that you really want to record stably for many months, uh, maybe the semi-chronic paradigm may not be good enough for you. You know, maybe you might actually resort to hard cementing procedure. And one interesting forefront of this kind of unit combating unit loss is actually coating the probe. And this is something that has not been done for NeuroPixels Pro, but I'm really curious if this is something that we can push further. So uh, Tracy Quiz lab at Pittsburgh has um, coated a neuronexus probe with a cell adhesion molecule. 
And this actually helps uh, basically prevent the inflammation of the uh, electrode track. And in some cases that they were able to actually preserve units much longer than non-coded control. So I'm not sure if this is actually, you know, compatible with the NeuroPixels Pro, but this is a kind of stuff that could potentially help the community in the, in, in the future. Okay, so in summary, uh, I discussed that the five different methods, really, it's a really great time for, for you to get started on these kinds of semi-chronic recording. And they all use very similar principles and their differences, of course, in how it's optimized for different uses, but they are all efficient in probe retrieval. So this is a great news. And how, how do we choose optimum system? I, I really suggest that you consider that, that there are different methods and there are different method, methods for a good reason. They're validated in a different way. So do look for these differences and then pick the one that's similar to your applications. And there are lots of pitfalls. It's even though that uh, this method exists and you know, they're reliable, uh, but it doesn't mean that it's, you know, one, it doesn't mean that this is one size fits all. Um, so do consider pitfalls. And, and again, I would like to stress that, that this local knowledge base is really important when adopting these kinds of uh, recording methods. So for example, UCL, we have um, you know, uh, taught uh, many individuals how to do some of the system that develop, we developed. So there's a community knowledge about how to do these things. And I think that it's probably the same way for many of the uh, research centers. So uh, with that, I would really like to thank all the probe developers. Uh, so some of, some of them you know, attended this talk. I, I really thank for your contributions. And, and, and also they provided um, slides for, for this presentation. And then of course the feedback and some of them actually provided preliminary data. So thank you so much for that. And I thank Nick and Matteo for the organization of this wonderful uh, the workshop. And I, I thank the audience. And um, uh, since we have developers here, uh, please ask questions. And then they're, you know, they're here, we're here to answer any questions you might have. And I think this is a great opportunity. Great. So with that, um, maybe have only one minute for question, but. Uh, yeah, so the, the, thank you so much, Yo. The, the, there were quite a few questions. Some were answered in typing. Um, and so, some are live and you, why don't you take like three, four minutes to answer. We can tell you what the top ones are and then the rest ones you guys could type away because you can type answers too. So, so the first question I see is from Thomas Sainsbury. Are you more likely to miss targets within the brain relative to acute recordings? Cementing these casing in place seems like it leaves a lot more room for error. Um, my answer is no. I don't find that there are more mistargeting events, but maybe chime in, like maybe others. Okay, we'll move on to the next then. Um, yo, I noticed that when my animals hit the walls in the behavior chamber, there's a lot of noise. Do any of the designs work to lessen the effect of the hits? Yeah, this is a really tough and annoying problem. I know we saw it with our implant, um, you know, short of making the walls really soft or something. I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe Adrian has a view on this. Yeah. Um... I think one thing we do that is maybe a little more extreme than what other folks do is we are very, very aggressive with our grounding. Um, and I think that's key. When we've had noise, it's usually when the, the animal ground wasn't super secure. So um, what we actually do is we've repurposed um, steel uh, uh, infusion cannula, basically just a, a fairly thick gauge steel rod that we sharpen to have a kind of needle tip and we insert that directly into the brain by about a millimeter in somewhere that you don't care about um, and that really ensures that you have really strong electrical contact with the brain in your animal ground um, and um, and we when we do that we really don't have any problems with noise 
and, and we also short the uh, external reference to that animal ground. Um, when, when we use that approach, we, we have really good success with low noise recordings. Great, let's see if we can get to one more question. Yeah. Um, well, there's a question about the 10%, no, uh, it, cable tangling and choice of commutator slippering for chronic recordings. Uh, Yo, um, how many of the implants that you mentioned have been used for freely moving versus head fixed? Because only some, I bet, have been used for free moving. Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, Ashley's and Sebastian and and ours and and and, uh, and you know Thomas and Adrian's. Okay, so then the question Four is: out of five. How do you deal with commutator cable tangling and things like that? So maybe Daniel can be a best person to answer this. Sure. Yeah. So I really owe credit to any solution to Dario Campagno, if you um, saw him from Tiago's lab. So there's a um, commutator by Dorich that was successful with phase 3A, uh, which is actually previous to the commercial 1.0. So that is um, my only direct experience, and that is what I use. Um, I, I understand this has been successful uh, with now commercially available probes, but I'm just not an expert. So I would uh, divert the question to him, but he's not here. All right, I don't want to.